football season is over, and many of you are feeling a void. There is only so much one can do to try to fill it. Those empty Sundays, loneliness, boredom, what is there to do? Between me and you with the everyday E25s, things have gotten a little more vibrant in my life. This is all thanks to Raycon, the sponsor of today's video. The sleek design and customizable fit of their versatile earbuds are perfect for nearly every situation. Lounging around, hearing a podcast, doing chores, working from home, even exercise. The seamless Bluetooth capabilities, strong color selection, six hours of battery life, and quality sound flooding your ears make anything better. And they come in at roughly half the cost of the major competitors. Was your Valentine's Day lonely? Raycons are the perfect companion for a quiet night in. Perhaps I want to get away from looking at a computer or TV screen. The everyday E25s are the way to go without feeling totally disconnected. If you don't feel they're for you, they have a hassle-free 45-day money-back guarantee. There's no reason not to try them out for a bit. Tell you what, do you want 15% off of your order? Then simply go to buyraycon.com slash utree to capitalize on the savings. The doldrums of winter suck, but the everyday E25s by Raycon can help out in a few ways. And now on to the main attraction. Roll that beautiful rebuilding footage. Let's go back and take a trip to 2019. Life was a hell of a lot better back then. We were able to go to bars and socialize in public. Fans packed stadiums and arenas across the land. Football was able to be viewed on something other than a television, unless you're lucky. During this time, the Miami Dolphins were considered to be the finest tank above the Tropic of Cancer. With the defeats commencing, I made a video trying to dissect what I believe to be deliberate losing for one man. To a Tonga Vailoa. As usual, I express cynicism and derision at their effort, mainly in their ideals of ruining everything by the horrible art of winning, most notably against Indianapolis, the Bungles, and the coup de grace against the New England Patriots. In Week 17, Ryan Fitzpatrick led his team on a clutch final drive to give the Dolphins the win. It may have permanently changed the scope of the NFL landscape, and allowed several teams with agonizing histories to win championships the past two years but I feared it took them out of some of the finer prizes in the draft. They finished with the fifth overall pick. For a team that looked completely horrible at the start of the year, it's great progress but goes against the art of the tank. But what has happened since then? Has the Miami Dolphins' sudden comeback ruined them in the art of the tank? So far, that answer has been no. Over the past year, the Dolphins have been a team that's turned around my thinking. I don't know if it's due to tactical planning, a lucky roll of the dice, or a combination of the above, but they've intrigued me. In terms of a rebuild, you have to look at several aspects to gauge its progress. Personnel, team structure, and on-field performance. First, the personnel. In past years, the Dolphins were known for going after the big splashes in free agency. From the Mike Wallaces to the Ndamukong Suze, they tried to make the largest moves, yet it rarely turned the needle. Remember how they had to shed a lot of their big signings a few years ago in an attempt to make a culture change, when the real culture that needed to be made was... <clears throat> Enough said about that. This time around, they went for big signings, but those of substance. Those that would offer much needed stability. They had a lot of cap space coming into last offseason, and the plan was to make it count. Team defense and structure were most important to them. Several of the bigger names on the market were cornerback Byron Jones and linebacker Kyle Van Noy. Both were nabbed by the Dolphins. The defensive line was bolstered by Shaq Lawson and Emmanuel Agba. Both had talent, but weren't able to fully translate it onto the field. Even then, it's still an upgrade. There were several moves on offense, mostly bringing in Eric Flowers for 10 million per year. I'm thinking, wait, Eric Flowers? The parking cone from the Giants? Him? Apparently, he managed to salvage his career as a guard for Name Redacted. Better fit for his overall skills. They had brought in a few running backs in Jordan Howard and Matt Breida, but they never really managed to break into the roster. Howard got cut a few weeks into the season, but they did get the prize they were looking for. Tua. He fell in the draft to the fifth overall pick. The fears of fucking up the tank were overblown. They got what they wanted in the end. Although Joe Burrow became the much better prospect by draft time, Tua was still highly regarded. But he had developed health concerns. With their other first round picks in this draft, thanks Pittsburgh and Houston, they picked Austin Jackson and Noeg Benogany. Whether or not they thrive at this level is to be determined. The next year wasn't considered a big year for the Dolphins. All people were expecting out of them was progress. A low bar, but still something that can be failed as other franchises have proven in the past. They'd have Ryan Fitzpatrick back as a steady hand, so they weren't going to chuck Tua into the fire immediately. Good sign so far. 
but the real progress I saw would come in the form of team structure and coaching. This is the part that surprised me from them. I especially saw it around the halfway point of the year. The Dolphins had molded into a legitimately formidable unit, and the thing is was that they were doing it in completely differing ways. Against the Rams, it was strong defense carrying the team. Versus Arizona, they managed to keep up with them offensively with Tua starting the game. San Francisco was just a bloodbath against a team slowly suffering from internal injuries. A team that wins 8 of 10 in the NFL has to earn it. And in many ways, they did. Did they overachieve when you consider their team? Yes. Does it mean that such progress should be dismissed? Absolutely not. The group had several key talents emerge as franchise cornerstones. The main one being Xavier Howard. He was one of the holdouts from the great tanking and culture changes, and he emerged as one of the best cornerbacks in the league. Spectacular play after spectacular play against elite receivers. Leading the league in interceptions and pass deflections. In the age of offensive football, this is outstanding production. And at his contract, it's a bargain. Mike Kosicki's looked solid as a tight end over the past few years. When he's healthy, Devontae Parker is a game changer. Miles Gaskin and Salvan Ahmed became decent running backs. Jerome Baker was a solid presence in the linebacking core. Jason Sanders became one of the most automatic kickers in the league. And yes, I am building a shrine to Xavier's greatness, don't judge me. What I will do though is judge Brian Flores. I had my concerns about him last year, not because of what he did in New England, but because I was fearing he needed more time to develop as a coach. It was a very risky move for Miami to make, and he has honestly rewarded them for it. He's taken the opportunity he's been given and has run with it so far. Over the past two years, he's evolved as a coach, as a mentor, and as a motivator. You can see it in his game planning and the way his players buy into the schemes. He's shown that he's willing to take risks, especially with his quarterback deployment. Having a starter-reliever mentality at QB is unconventional, but it has worked for him so far. Most importantly, he's something that nearly every other coach from the Belichick tree isn't. Authentic. Too many times have his disciples tried to come in and force themselves into the equation instead of letting things come naturally. They try way too hard to be aggressive and in your face, and that doesn't work at this level. From what I've seen, Flores isn't trying to be Bill Belichick. He's trying to be Brian Flores. And that goes a long way to winning over a locker room. Those strides also showed in the on-field performance of the team this past season. This team needed a true leader, and I think Flores is that from what he has shown. The Dolphins weren't expected to be anywhere near a playoff spot at the beginning of the year, yet only missed the playoffs by one game. The AFC was incredibly top-heavy, and a 10-win team missing the playoffs entirely is quite rare. They got crushed by Buffalo in the final game as they were trying to make a statement. It sucks, but it shouldn't do anything about long-term optimism. Miami has answered every question about them this season and then some. Even then, they have a few consolation prizes coming their way. I've been on record saying that the Dolphins trading Laramie Tunsil was a mistake. Franchise caliber talents at left tackle are rare to find and the return wouldn't be enough to overcome such a move. Looking back at it now, there was one variable I didn't take into account. That the Texans would implode as an organization. That segment has been beaten to death. But thanks to said implosion, Miami now holds the third overall pick. As well as an early second rounder from Houston. With Houston's selection, the options are now wide open for them. They could go for a potentially elite wide receiver in Devontae Smith. They could draft another potential franchise caliber tackle in Panay Sewell. They could trade down with a team desperate for a quarterback and bring back a premium haul like the Colts did a few years ago. But there is one big question coming up for the Dolphins, and it's in Tua. He's struggled plenty in his performance, and in the age of rookie quarterbacks being asked to take a huge role from the start, the microscope is on him. He had been benched several times during the season for Fitzpatrick. The offense ran much smoother without him and so. Several Dolphins players have gone off the record questioning if he's the right guy for them moving forward. He has shown that he could have a high floor, but what about his ceiling? It's way too early to start calling him a bust like some are doing. And I would keep him as the starter for next season, but I am more conservative in my approach. The new NFL demands results immediately. If not, you end up like Josh Rosen and Dwayne Haskins. Afterthoughts. Miami should know a bit about one of those two. Perhaps with Chan Gailey resigning, the offense won't be as conservative as it was with him under center. Perhaps the co-offensive coordinator effort will be what it takes to get to it to reach his potential. Or maybe those Deshaun Watson rumors have legs after all. But those are speculative questions. And the same goes for what the Dolphins will do moving forward. As I said, the team grew on me over the season. 
They've honestly turned me from a doubter into someone who is eager to see how they will evolve over the next year or two. There are plenty of roads they can take, especially with such a top prize as the third overall pick, and I'll be interested to see what they do. They still have a decent amount of cap space to make a few moves this offseason. For as cynical as I am about Steven Ross, he is a hands-off owner. I have confidence that it will stay as such moving forward, especially with the structure that seems to be developing. Hopefully in a year or two I can make a video about the art of the contender, but that will require more work. Work that the Dolphins seem to be eager to do. Good luck, boys. See if Fitzpatrick can pull a trick out. He got hit as he lofted it up. Boom, coverage! Matt Collins is inbounds at the 41. It's a 34-yard gain, and there's a flag down, likely for a face mask. 